we have a good mix of people here today. So one thing I like to ask too is, what would you share with everybody here about your particular level of care that maybe you think they don't know? Um, for example, mine as a PA is, when I was a paramedic, my idea of what a PA is and what we do in the ER was very different because I saw, kind of thought they were doctor's assistants for a while. Like a lot of times they're in the room and the doc's doing all the talking and the assessment. I'm like, well, what are they doing other than following them around? And being on this side of it, you know, I am my own provider. You know, we do work as a team, but a lot of our care is provided away from the patient. So when we're doing things in front of the computer, putting in orders and consulting specialists and um, getting patients admitted, doing procedures, you know, I do feel pretty autonomous a lot of the time. So I'm not just a doctor's assistant, um, even though that can be how it appears, I think, sometimes from the exterior. Um, so that's thing I, one thing I like to share with paramedics, especially those that are debating going to PA schools. You, you are your own provider, even though if maybe that's doesn't, how it doesn't appear in your brief interactions in the ER. Um, but do you guys have anything else too that, that would apply or that you would share with a doctor that you want to, them to know about EMTs or something like that? I think regardless of what level of care you provide, I think just from my experience, I think a lot of people should be able to fall back on, can I do my job without electricity? If the lights went out in the hospital, could I still do my job? I think, especially when, as an EMT, like, I can pretty much do my job without any electricity. So, you know, when we have, like, a downtime or whatever, I know it stresses a lot of folks out. Um, but kind of when we're up front in triage, I think there's an expectation. I just have to remind people, like, I'm the look at the person level of care mm -hmm. as an EMT just having an understanding like I just kind of like touch like oh they're very sweaty and cold or you know look <laughs> get some vitals that, that again I are all battery powered or I don't even need electricity I think kind of getting back to that holistic obviously not looking at their chart but looking at the patient kind of thing um, treating I, the monitor and treating the exactly patient. and I've seen a lot of people really thrive at that there's like definitely providers nurses medics and EMTs that I mean, like I said, as an EMT, our toolbox is so not limited necessarily, but so specific that for us, that's a little easier because that's just, that's a part of it. But um, I think sharing that with people like, hey, just think think if you didn't have a telemetry, think if you didn't have your computer kind of thinking, what's in it? What would I, what would I do? Mm -hmm. How would I assess this person? Uh, I thought that was interesting seeing doctors because we had obviously doctors on ships or wherever we were that had to do it without anything. And it was very inter interesting to see, because when I got to the ED, I was overwhelmed. I was like, this is a lot of stuff. I've even been in an <laughs> OR on a, on a ship before. And even compared to that, like those are, I feel like a lot of docs would get in an OR on a naval vessel or what have you during a mass casualty or something and be like, okay, all right. I guess I can work, is it like 1955? I don't now understand. Smoke, yeah. yeah, now I can smoke. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's ashtrays, of course, it's fair. Uh, so I, I just, I think that's a very interesting perspective that. It, you can really tell whose experiences are different by who thrives on that or who's willing to open their mind to that kind of perspective. I found that to be really helpful. I think that's like really big in the field as paramedics yeah. or EMTs. Like it, that's what we, that is what we are doing. Yeah. Because we don't have lab work and we don't have, you know, x-rays and we don't have all this other stuff that can really give you like, sorry, give you the, <laughs> the answers to the questions. Mm -hmm. Um, or more of an answer, we have to go off of signs, symptoms, what does my patient look like, what, mm -hmm. is, what are the surroundings, that kind of stuff. And I think that's great. Like, I like to just get rid of that monitor for a minute. Stop binging. Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> just turn it off <laughs> and then seat. do your job like <laughs> you said, without electricity. And I think you can learn a lot that way. So I would also say too that I think maybe physicians or people in the emergency room versus people in the field like we were kind of talking about earlier we don't completely understand one or the other unless you have experience in both mm -hmm. and um i would say that like this is the same anywhere not all providers are created equal and so like if you've had a poor experience with someone from the field that doesn't mean that like the next person is going to be that way like mm. the next person might have a lot more knowledge and skills 
than you know the previous and so just to make like an assumption based off of that one person is not fair one thing i think that paramedics don't realize about nurses is that nurses just want to know if the patient has an iv they're not criticizing you for not starting one <laughs> <laughs> they just want to know if they have yeah. one and if they need one i just want to know well, if they have a pulse <laughs> yeah because <laughs> that's the first thing that you do when like in the ers you're like well i gotta draw my labs yeah. so like, do they have an IV? I'd always be like, no, and I couldn't start one because we were only three minutes away from the hospital, and I didn't have enough time, and I was taking their vital signs, and then I had to call in, and, and they were like, no, I just want to know if they have one so we can start one. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, one thing that is kind of different about emergency medicine than even like other specialties and even pre-hospital is that I'm mostly paid to not get tricked into missing something big. Mm -hmm. And that I think is hard to sometimes explain because like when somebody comes in and they've got like epigastric pain and they had like pizza the night before, like like I know that looks like it's probably acid reflux and probably like 90% of the time it is, but they mostly pay me to find the 10% that's not. And so it can be tricky because Sometimes I'll feel foolish like putting in orders or not putting in orders for something. And and like sometimes what goes through my mind is like, oh, like I know this is probably not anything. But I always have to remind myself that like a few times it has been something that I've missed. And so sometimes that's the benefit of like seeing the labs down the down the line is you realize, oh, man, I was totally wrong. I thought it was mm -hmm. I thought it was acid reflux, but it turned out it was a ended up like a high troponin and it was a heart attack. So I think that's one thing that's unique. And it's hard to explain that to even specialists too, where they're like, why did you get a, why did you get a CAT scan of that guy's aorta when it ended up being, you know, this or that. And it's because there's been a couple of times when it hasn't been, you know, or like a lot of times when it hasn't been. Mm -hmm. That's very unique, I think, to us too in the pre-hospital and emergency medicine realm compared to, you know, down the line of ways when we've filtered through a bunch of stuff. Um, but an important part of the job you know, to realize that we're kind of the pessimists a little bit in mm -hmm. medicine of like thinking what all this could be. It probably isn't, but I'm just going to make sure, you know, no, that, that's a great point. Cause I think when I was a paramedic, I felt like we almost the culture, at least at the time, and maybe it was just me was operating more like you kind of have to prove to me that you're dying. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like I don't, I'm going to start with the assumption that there's nothing dangerous going on and you have to kind of prove it to me mm -hmm. on your 12 lead or on your vital signs or whatever. And, we as ER providers operate the opposite way. You know, we assume that you're dying from whatever your symptoms are, <laughs> and we've got to prove to ourselves and to you that that's not the case. Because um, I think we're a little bit, it's more litigious at this level than I think as a paramedic. Um, and as a paramedic, you have the fallback of, well, we're taking you to the ER anyway. So if something gets missed, it's going to be on them, not on me. And so I think, you know, it's easy to see, like, I think especially in the, the triage process, you're like, why aren't we discharging this patient? And I'm like, wow, well, but if it could be this and everybody has a different risk tolerance for that, right? Like mm -hmm. some patient, you know, some providers might discharge somebody and be like, ah, it's, this is unlikely enough that I'm okay discharging you. And some providers are, ah, what if it is a heart attack? And, you know, so I think it is very provider dependent, but that is a good point. I think to a big pass on to, to people it, yeah. that we have to be the pessimist and assume that this is something really bad until proven otherwise. Um, when maybe I think at least when I was a paramedic, that's not how I operated necessarily. Not that I wouldn't take patients to the ER, but you had that as a fallout. So it's easy to write them off when somebody else is going to work them up. You know? mm -hmm. And that discharge button is sometimes a lot of pressure because mm -hmm. you're like, I'm taking all risk that this will go well, that I didn't miss something. And so sometimes when you're going home at night, it's the people that you discharge that make you worry more than mm -hmm. like the people that you like brought in just because you don't want to miss something yeah. and you can take it to extreme and some, some people do. So there's definitely a fine balance to it. But I think knowing that I think helps everybody give everybody more like benefit of the doubt that, mm. yeah, it probably is acid reflux. We'll just be sure real quick and then we'll destroy right. it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like that we have like such a team atmosphere like in the ED is because it's like, I trust some of my techs that have been there for a long time and know certain things than, or had an experience or whatever. And I'm like, great, what do you think? Let's talk about it. 
or debrief after like a code or after a traumatic patient or whatever I do my best to try and pull the staff together and be like everybody good if you're not good let's talk about it or if you want to do one-on-one um I recently started tra- training for relief charge and I'm getting used to the pulseras and so I like to send the thumbs up emoji sometimes when I <laughs> got 1200 pulseras I'm just like great see you soon we'll figure it out I don't have a bed yet but yeah, right. we'll figure it um so getting that aspect onto it too is you're just like yeah, there's 30 people that are walking in, and now we have 30 ambulances just rolling around. Oh, and there's two helicopters on our helipad. So, yeah. all right, let's figure it out. Let's do this. And I think that at least where I am, we, on nights, we have a very good team atmosphere that we have those people that you trust and those people that you know have been like, I've seen some doctors do some wild things where I'm just like, I would trust you to take care of my family member. <laughs> I think that's we get spoiled in sometimes working in medicine by being like, I like that one. I don't like that right. one. How can we change? How can we grow? You know, and help each other out. I think the the nurses eating their young thing is not as bad as it used to be. I feel. I think EMS has gotten better about that too, because that's kind of the old saying with EMS too is they eat their young. But I feel like it's improved. I don't know what you guys that are actually in the field think, but. I think, um, actually, I think you're right, but I think there needs to be a balance because I also think that we, everywhere in all of medicine, are so understaffed that we are just shoving people through Mm -hmm. anything, like Mm -hmm. school, training, all that stuff, and I think that's really unfortunate because, one, it it does a disservice to the provider. Mm -hmm or the student or whatever and two um well i don't know what i was gonna say that was what i was gonna say (laughs) it can be scary yeah yeah i mean the standards can fall if you're just trying to pump out new graduates to work yeah so i feel like that's kind of part of the culture right now and i find it problematic but then there's like i don't do that so then right. there's not everybody's doing that kind of sure thing. like i want to make sure that we take time and if you're not ready i'm not gonna say here you go right have at it mm-hmm. i'm not gonna do that right <laughs> so so i think there needs to be more balance but i definitely don't think that it's like it's not like like when i started you know it was like if you don't pass this you fail if you mm-hmm. don't pass this you fail like you could go through all of paramedic school fail your pharmacology final or fail your cardiology final and you're kicked out. Right. That didn't happen to me. <laughs> but that could happen. I do remember that, <laughs> that a lot a in paramedic school. that was a hard fast rule. Like, yeah. yeah. I remember that. They were like, there, yeah. man, they build up some of these tests. They're like, well, here's here's another test. If you fail, you're out. I'm like, what? <laughs> Two quizzes How many in a of these are week? there? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. Kind of get kicked out. What's PA happening? school is kind of the same way, though. I feel like every... So if you get test anxiety, it was just like tenfold because of how mm-hmm. they built up all these tests. Yep. Yep. It was crazy. They don't do that. I don't know the specifics, but it's not like that specifically was for our, for our cycle or where we went. But hmm. it's not like that anymore, which is not necessarily bad, right. like I said, but the balance needs to yeah. be there, I think. <laughs> One final question for you guys as we wrap up. What advice would you give yourself five or ten years ago, knowing what you know now about emergency medicine, about your level of care? I think um, I'd remind myself I don't have to be perfect at it. That was tough for me, like especially like right out of like right out of training, but especially when I was in training too, just remembering that at the end of the day, you do the very best you can and doing the best you can doesn't mean you always made the right choices, but it means that you will take whatever you messed up and adapt it for the next time. And I think the only time when you like really fail at that is when you stop caring about trying. You stop caring about the patient, and so it doesn't mean you get every answer right. And I think that would probably have alleviated a lot of stress that I felt, especially right at the beginning. Um, am I still caring about people? Am I still trying to make the best decision? I'm good. You know, that's good. Mm-hmm. Mine would be, I guess, take care of yourself before you take care of patients. I think I spent too many years making work the top priority, like not exercising before coming into work, not eating well, um, you know, making it all about just working overtime and 12 hour shifts are hard to do anything else in between. So if you're working a bunch of shifts and not taking your days off, I just think I made work and, you know, 
seeing the next patient on the ambulance a higher priority than myself. And I think as I've gotten older and achieved a little bit better work-life balance, I think I've realized that I need to actually take care of myself before I go into work. Mine, I think, is still keep asking questions because medicine is so, and it changes mm, all the time. That's every a good day. one. There's something different. And so I'm a huge advocate in being like just using the people around you to ask questions or different be like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Can I bounce that off of you? Are we tracking? Am I missing something? Are we both missing something? Is you know, mm-hmm. because I think the the moment you think you know everything is a dangerous spot. Absolutely. Um, and then just you know, I love my job. I think that's a huge ass. Like, even though some days are worse than others, like, I love what I do and I love that place and the people I work with. You know, I think that that really helped me it's just like man i just love it in the chaos M- most days you know <laughs> there's other days where you're like man it'd be nice to just not have yeah. everyone try and die tonight that'd be cool but <laughs> you know for the most part i think that was a big a big thing for me is just loving where i was at no one to ask for help that's pretty simple yeah. i don't like asking for help yeah i got this bolus it's just me i've looked at the registration person and it's just me up there and everyone's in the back handling a violent code or something and i'm like i, I quote black hawk down or something yeah. i'm like it's gordy's gone man i'll be outside uh so i'm like all right it's just us and i just i'm like all right it's just us and then here we go and uh i'm just very stubborn so i think telling younger me it's okay i've always been bad about that yeah it's that's like a good one this industry has that I don't blame people because yeah. you're just like they're busy doing something. Why would yeah. I bother them with like, mine? I, so. I can see you. We're drowning too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone's suffering together. We're all drowning it's together. The best. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I would go back five or ten years because I would go back further than that. <laughs> and like, if I knew what I knew now, set myself up for a different path, like this path, but then more after that. I guess like I wouldn't stop at paramedic I would continue on to other things because I'm just really interested in it so and then also like always learn and ask questions of course like yeah. you should definitely always be doing that but if I could give myself advice I would be I would be telling myself to do a different pathway in school I guess but I would never know that as a 20 year old. Like, yeah. Sometimes I wonder if like, if I would have been better off going like the nursing route, cause I think nurse to NP is a really good route and mm-hmm. like nurses make good money and you can work while you're in NP school. And so I'm like, <laughs> yeah. gosh, if I, but it's so hard. Hindsight's 2020. 20. It's so hard to go back and be like, I was like such a lost early 20 year old. I like didn't know what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to be a doctor for a while. And then I was like, there's no way I can go to school that long. Like after one semester was like super hard. I was like, there's no way I can do college for that long. And so I've been in college for 10 years instead. And (laughs) it's hard to know. Yeah. And I think probably working in this area is part of why being a paramedic is difficult because we have a really big scope of practice. Oh my gosh, I can't talk a large scope of practice and with that there is a lot of training there's a lot of you have to self-study mm-hmm. like if you want to be good at your job you have to learn mm-hmm. outside of work all the time and so the bar is set really high which i like and so then that makes me want to like level up more mm-hmm. but that's not really realistic all the time and so i a lot of the time i feel like paramedicine is not well understood and like kind of uh, forgotten about a little bit like okay cool you drove the ambulance like good job you i have a sticker (laughs) speaking of stickers i have a sticker that says ambulance driver on it (laughs) it's my favorite one because i can't tell you how many people (laughs) call me that and that's fine like whatever but i'm like you don't understand (laughs) You don't understand the standard yeah. that yeah. I've set for myself. <laughs> and that is set for us. Right. <laughs> and 
not an ambulance driver. But sometimes I'll tell people, like, yep, I'm just an ambulance driver. And they'll yeah. be like, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's above my pay. You know, you got to read the room. Yeah, you exactly. can use you it for your manage manage that where we want it. Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. It's like, I can't read that because it's above my pay grade. <laughs> I think the biggest thing I would say to myself is, um, like, five, I'd say five years ago, um, would be just to, like, um, like don't let everybody else take you down because <laughs> there were so many people that were because I was hospital to paramedic right someone some people would call that zero to hero right um a lot of people said don't do that a lot of people kept saying like that's not going to work out for you you're going to be a bad paramedic you're going to just like a lot of people and I think I should not have listened to that mm -hmm. I think I just should have gone for it trusted my gut and just went went straight for that and mm -hmm. And not, um, I had a lot of hesitation in it. I was like, well, maybe I should drop out of paramedic school. Maybe this mm. is not for me. Maybe like, um, and I, I'm really happy that I ended up where I am because I, I love my job. Yeah. I love, I, it was really hard to earn the operational side of things for the first like six months. But after that, like I have a lot of knowledge and a lot of like, um, yeah, knowledge from the hospital. Like I paid attention. I asked mm -hmm. a lot of questions when I was working in the hospital and that has only benefited me and i feel like it puts me at some sort of an advantage not initially but now it does and <laughs> people are really opinionated you. about the zero to hero debate and i think it's there's a misconception that you need to work as an emt for two years before you go to paramedic school i was talking to kim recently and like it doesn't predict your success in paramedic school at all because like you can't quantify how good your experience was or like how ambitious of a person you are. Maybe you're just good at taking tests. Like there's so many other qualities mm -hmm. that make a bigger impact than, oh, you need to work as an EMT in the field for two years. Right. There's just no way to, like you should give that advice to people. But but a lot of paramedics and EMTs are very opinionated about that though. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how it is in nursing too. That like, you know, the new grad debate <laughs> of being in specialty areas and however else, you know. Yeah, I think it's dependent on the person, 100%. really, because yeah. the yeah. the learning curve is a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot if you have no experience, and it's a yeah. lot if you do have some experience. And the hospital, like ER experience, I still use it today too. When from when I was there, like it helped me be a better paramedic. One hundred percent. Like, um, so yeah, I think it's a blanket statement. I don't think that it's not everyone should do it, but if you're the right person who can handle it and do it that I don't think that that's going to determine solely whether or not you're good at your job, mm -hmm. you know? And on the flip side too, I mean, they get EMTs in the programs that have been EMTs for a long time and they've, they know what to do in a lot of situations, but they're why they have no idea. And so right. mm -hmm. they know like when to do certain things, but they don't understand the physiology behind it. And that can actually be dangerous and prevents them from learning the reasons mm -hmm. why. And so sometimes they just treat a fast heart rate without trying to figure out what the underlying cause is. You know, like the example we always use is AFib with RVR, right. like just giving cardizem when they're septic. It's like, well, this is their sinus tack. But if you understand the why, you're like, no, we're not giving diltiazem, we'll give them some fluids, you know? Mm -hmm. So I mean, you can't just treat a number. And I think sometimes EMTs go into school with the wrong idea of that and it actually hinders them from being successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would yeah. also say learning from anybody was a huge thing mm -hmm. too. Because there were some, like, younger EMTs that, like, just got hired or, like, a patient or some, someone that just gave me, like, a nugget of wisdom mm -hmm. that I was, like, not expecting. Mm -hmm. And I think initially I was like, oh, you don't know anything. Right. Um, but now I'm like, what? The six-year-old, like, knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting to see that, like, some people have an experience in medicine that you've never come across at all, even though they're so brand new. You know, like, mm -hmm. we talk about, like, cricothyrotomies, right? And, like somebody right out of school all of a sudden does one and then the person that's been in it for 20 years has never done never one. Done it, yeah. So it's like medicine is so wide and mm -hmm. so varied and everybody's so different that I think everybody has something they can learn from each other because of that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Does anybody have any final thoughts before we close out? Anything that was burning on your mind to say when you were coming in that you didn't get to say or anything? Cool. We'll end it there. Thanks guys for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks.